We live in a world that's seeking a distraction, a diversion from the everyday activities of life. Reality seems broken to us and our lives lack depth. And we're all seeking something beyond ourselves. Some seek excitement, some seek adventure or thrills. But what is the need for this distraction? It is because we are burdened. We are burdened with boredom, with guilt, fear, doubt, poverty, and hunger. We seek rest from these burdens, and so we escape into any other world we can. Drugs, money, violence, crime, music, movies, games, anything to make us forget our present pain. But the world has a real problem. Not only is it filled with guilt, fear, and doubt, and boredom, but there are people that want to make money off of the fact that you are not in control. Your pain, your bad health. For your boredom, they want to sell you video games. But beneath the noise and clamor, a still, small voice. A voice that says, Come, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But the one solution to our problems becomes lost and the voice of a loving God gets drowned out in the voice of people who poorly misrepresent him, and in the voice of those who would take his place. Could media, even interactive media, be allowing false gods and the occult into our homes? Gods to replace the one true God? How about video games? Could they be involved in this as well? Video games a multi-billion dollar a year industry that offer photorealistic worlds you can interact with and manipulate. You can be the hero and save the world. Or, in some games, you can be the villain and destroy it. And although Nintendo did not invent the video game, that's where we'll begin. Video games did not come onto the scene until the 1960s, but Nintendo is actually older than video games. They actually got their start making gambling cards fashioned after 15th century European gambling cards. But how would European cards ever find their way to Japan? Well, in the 15th century, Portugal was the native home of a popular style of playing cards, dragon cards. These were forerunners to our modern playing card deck, and they have the same foundation as the tarot cards, with the suits, swords, cups, clubs, and coins. These are the same suits that eventually became the suits in our modern playing cards. Spades, hearts, clubs, and diamonds. Often these cards were used in gambling, not much unlike our modern playing card deck. Sir Francis Xavier, a Portuguese priest for the Catholic Church, inadvertently is responsible for bringing gambling to Japan. In August of 1549, Sir Francis Xavier came as a missionary to Kagoshima, Japan, in the name of a group for which he was a co-founder, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. The men on his ship brought their Portuguese dragon cards along with them on the voyage, and were all too eager to teach the native Japanese not only how to play, but how to gamble as well. As gambling spread, the Japanese government outlawed the act of private gambling. Thus, the people had to change their cards if they were going to keep them, and so they came up with the whimsical and colorful flower designs of the Hanafuda cards. 340 years later, Nintendo began to mass-produce these same cards, and these became Nintendo's main source of income for almost a hundred years. Nintendo literally owes their business to none other than Sir Francis Xavier, the same man that suggested there should be an Inquisition. If this Jesuit priest had not accidentally brought gambling to Japan, Nintendo could never have existed. On September 23, 1889, Fusajiro Yamauchi founded a small company called Nintendo Kopai, or the Nintendo Playing Card Company. Nintendo is a Japanese word that could be roughly translated, it comes from heaven. Nintendo's first venture was making handmade Hanafuda cards, but over time, this expanded into a line of vacuum cleaners even into a taxi cab service, a love hotel chain, and toys similar to this love tester from 1978. But their success didn't begin until Shigeru Miyamoto, an engineer by trade, made his first game for Nintendo in the 1970s, Donkey Kong. 
It's kind of like filmmaking where there's certain rules of editing and composition and you have to go back to the early, early filmmakers like D.W. Griffith or later Orson Welles to find the guys who really made those rules that we all follow today. In video games, the guy who's responsible for all this is Shigeru Miyamoto. Shigeru Miyamoto was hired by Nintendo in 1977. They hired him to design the artwork that goes on the side of game cabinets. Yeah, he worked as a staff artist. He's intellectually curious, always seeing what was going on. And then in 1979, he actually had his first shot at designing a game. At this point, Nintendo's trying to break into America, and so they try to do this with a game called Radar Scope. Now, it didn't go over so well, so they ended up having like a few thousand of these cabinets left. So, you know, in desperation, they looked at this, you know, young artist and said, hey, you know what, you want to make a game? We got all these Radar Scope machines. See what you can do. We got nothing else to lose. Take all these Radar Scope parts. We got the cabinets, the joysticks, the screens. Just reprogram them. Make your own game. Let's see what happens. So, Miyamoto gets to work, and pfft, out comes Donkey Kong. Not only was Donkey Kong a runaway success, it also introduced to the world Nintendo's first superstar character, Super Mario. Mario! Mario! As popularity of Nintendo increased, it spread all across America. Now, when Nintendo releases a new game, People of all ages, from all over the world, are all too eager to run to the store to buy it. What began as nothing more than a hobby, has become a worldwide obsession. handmade Hanafuda cards made by Nintendo can be traced back to the Dragon cards from Portugal, which can in turn be traced back to a very early form of the tarot card deck. Called by names like the Devil's Bible Land, the Devil's Picture Book, tarot cards are common among occultists and spiritualists. Tarot cards are most famous for fortune telling, and what we currently call the modern playing deck of cards actually is derived from these cards. As stated before, common playing cards have four suits, spades, hearts, clubs, and diamonds, and all of these suits can be found in an earlier form in the tarot card deck. These are cups, wands, pentacles, and swords, which are also a modified form of the suits found in the dragon cards deck. Although playing cards have gained wide acceptance as an innocent game, they can still be used as tools of divination, as seen in this Michael Vubel painting, The Fortune Teller. And not only are modern playing cards usable for divination, even the cards Nintendo makes, the Hanafuda cards, can be used for divination as well. ...were a gift to me by my cousin. They are from Korea, although their origins are Japanese. Um, these little tiny cards come in a nice hard case. They are made of hard plastic, which is quite different to me than using tarot, which are typically made of paper. So um, the Hanafuda cards are most popularly used as a gambling game, but they can also be used for divination or fortune telling. Deuteronomy 18.10-12 is very clear on this issue. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead, 
for all who do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. You see, it's quite easy to take something occult like the tarot cards and over time modify them until they gain acceptance. Is it possible that modern games could have links to the occult as well? Perhaps, just like the tarot cards, something occult is slipping into our homes completely unnoticed. It was so easy for the tarot cards to find entrance into our homes, from an occult deck of cards to the modern-day playing deck cards. Would you really be surprised if the same thing didn't happen with the digital games of our time? History repeats itself. That which has been is what will be. That which has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.9 We should not be surprised to find that the exact same thing that happened in the past will happen again in the future. So does Nintendo have a policy on religion? Well, in the 90s, Nintendo would censor games based on this list of 10 rules. It's the closest thing that can be found to a policy on religion. Rule number 7 is very clear about what Nintendo games could portray. It says, Must not reflect ethnic, religious, nationalistic, or sexual stereotypes of language. This includes symbols that are related to any type of racial, religious, nationalistic, or ethnic groups such as crosses, pentagrams, God, gods, Satan, hell, Buddha. Nintendo was very clear that they did not want to insult any religious group, and they were very careful about what they would allow into any Nintendo games. So here's an example of Nintendo censorship. Can you guess what's been removed? The Japanese original of this game actually had a cross on the sign for the hospital. And this Disney game has been censored by having the crosses removed from the coffins. Notice this church steeple. In the Japanese original, there used to be a cross. And in this church interior, the stained glass window also used to be a cross. But Nintendo hasn't always followed by their own rules. You'd think from this that Nintendo had no intention of including religion in their games at all. But then one day, that changed forever. In 1986, Nintendo unveiled The Legend of Zelda, which took these same rules and threw them out the window. Notice that the main character has a cross on his shield similar to a medieval crusader. Why was this cross not censored? Perhaps Nintendo was not afraid of religious content after all. In fact, the religious content of this game doesn't end there. Notice that among the hero's loot, there is a yellow book. What is that book? The game's instruction booklet actually has the answer. It says, this is the wand that Wizrobe uses. Wave it to let loose magic spells. What's more, if Link picks up the magic book and learns some new spells, he can chant some fiery spells and send out flames. As you can see, in English, this book is titled The Magic Book, but the original Japanese title was The Bible. But could The Legend of Zelda be subtly attempting to reduce the Bible to an occult book of magic? The official Nintendo statement is that The Legend of Zelda is based on fantasy and that all of the religious content in the game has no basis in reality. But if that's true, why does official Nintendo artwork depict the main character praying before Jesus Christ on a crucifix? Perhaps there's more beneath the surface in Nintendo's games than they let on. Nintendo is in a large regard one of the most influential game companies in the world. While there are other companies like Sony and Microsoft, even these companies got their start by copying the successes of Nintendo. In the investigation of the influences these games have on the person playing them, it's very valuable to have insider information on the inspiration behind the games. Very rarely will Nintendo ever discuss direct inspiration for their games, but in one instance, an interview on Nintendo's own website, Wii.com, Shigeru Miyamoto decided to explain the genesis of the Super Mario Bros. franchise. Having rigorously analyzed what exactly made people want to play one more time, I sketched out the idea for five games. At this point, Nintendo was the licensee for Popeye. I asked if I could make a game using Popeye. The basic concept of Popeye is that there is the hero and his rival, who he manages to turn the tables on with the aid of spinach. It's identical to Pac-Man. This basically boils down to Mario being a replacement for Popeye. 
Mario was intended to be Popeye at one point, but it just didn't work out for whatever reason. Mario is Popeye and Pac-Man, but repackaged. This chart should illustrate this clearly. In each of these three stories, there is a hero, a female lead character, and a weapon that the hero uses to destroy the enemy. Popeye saves olive oil with spinach from Bluto. This spinach gives Popeye superhuman or almost godlike strength. In fact, it seems that there's nothing Popeye can't do when he eats spinach. Pac-Man also follows the same pattern, and somehow by eating power pellets, he is given almost superhuman or godlike strength to defeat ghosts. Once again, a godlike power. Mario saves a princess with a mushroom from a dragon. Now notice that all of these weapons are essentially something that A, gives the hero superhuman or godlike qualities, and B, are items that the character must put within themselves. In this case, all of them are food. This is food that makes you into a god. But wasn't there a place in the Bible where a serpent said that if someone ate a piece of fruit, they would be like God? Yes, that's exactly what happened. In Genesis, the deceiving serpent told Eve if she ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she would become like God. Because Eve doubted God, humanity had to be separated from their home in Eden and from the direct presence of God. Because they fell for his trick, evil came upon this world, all because he convinced Eve to eat a piece of fruit and that that fruit could transform her into a god. But these stories come from the angle that eating fruit that turns you into a god is good, just like Gnosticism which teaches that the serpent saved us from God with an apple. Hey YouTubers, thanks for watching. We have so much video game content that we made not one, not two, but three video game documentaries. You can check out more videos from this series over here. Don't forget to subscribe below. Check out our Patreon channel over here where you get rewards for helping support the work that we do. As always, you can rent these on our Vimeo channel or go to our store at littlelightstudios.tv. Thanks for watching.